and just thank you so much for joining us this evening. I'd like to congratulate Maria and Antonia on the launch of Buried God's Metal Profits. I'm really looking forward to hearing from that later on. And of course, to thank Luke and Sarah for all their support at Guillemot. Um, I want to thank Rose Ferriby as well for her beautiful illustration work on Tenter, but I'm going to be saying a bit more about that later on. So I'll come back to you later, Rose. I wanted to start by saying a few words about how Tenter came to be written and apologies some of you I know already know this but, but not all of you do and I think it's just worth giving you a tiny bit of context before I start reading from some of the poems. Back in 2017-18 I had the enormous privilege of being a poet in residence on a lecture series jointly hosted by Oxford Brooks and uh, Oxford University and this was a lecture series that focused on post-war commemoration, post-conflict commemoration. And being the poet in residence gave me this wonderful opportunity to meet so many different people who had direct experience of war. Refugees, military veterans, historians, politicians, artists, all sorts of people. And that really taught me two big lessons, I think. And the first was the multitude of voices and stories that are around any war and how many of those stories actually rarely make it into the public commemorations that we then make. Some of those voices seem to be completely forgotten um, or even deliberately perhaps not heard. And the second big lesson was what became increasingly apparent to me was what I call an ethical crisis and the way that we commemorate war in this country. And that's a crisis to do with the fact that we look back at previous wars and we have our big public events such as our parades, but we don't seem to be very good at making the connection between that and the refugee crisis from current wars, many of which we are still involved, involved with in certain ways. And that crisis to me is also to do with perhaps the way that we think about history and memory and the way that language is involved in those things. And so that's what Tenter is really all about. It's about exploring and problematizing the role of language and memory and history in the way that we think about war. Quite a lot of the poems in Tenter are quite long, so um, I'm going to just read some short extracts from a number of the poems just to give you a flavour of the journey of Tenter. I'm going to start with reading some extracts from the first poem in the book, which is called Memoration. And Memoration explores and unpacks some of the complications in that word, in that concept, commemoration. Memoration. Mammal, old English, deep thought, deep inwards. As a tree gives way, or the side of a hill from beneath. To leave this behind, each of us going back far enough. Mimeran, Dutch, to ponder, muse, as you follow the path down. Cognate with Old English, Memorian, or Middle English, Mamarin, be undecided, waver. A thread, surprising as gorse, jerks you on. You do not mean to remember for sale signs on your family home, to walk out of each moment as it flares bright as a stuck frame. Some stain or residue, some taint of red crossing into blue, follows each turn of your head as you... Memrong, proto-Germanic, take care, worry. This partial memory shrinking back beneath its moss crumbling from proto-indo-european mare smear to think about be mindful producing something you start to clear the house it's impossible to throw anything away you build a tower out of boxes hang it with lights mamarin Middle English also means to hesitate, pacing this field cautiously, a place for driving to, to think through, to measure your claim. The dead are thought about with care. They retreat and stiffen to a list of names. At first a little pliant, soft at the edges, 
but hardening to a hole you cannot enter. Still, a moment of breaking and entering. The memoration alludes to several research trips I made to the site of the Battle of Hastings, a muddy field which features in a number of Tenter's poems. But those trips also brought me to the great embroidered narrative of that particular conflict, the Bayer Tapestry, made in workshops, it seems, by English female embroiderers. And the central poem in Tenter, Et Elfgiva, is set in one of those workshops, and I'm going to read you a short extract from that poem. Et Elfgiva. It starts with Edward Rex and the noise and the arguing. Twenty of us sitting at a bench, Dame Bav watching us with orange eye and black claw. To start on the first panel laid on a board, on trestles so close together, no gap between us. Our needles, mad with blood, stab, stitch, wild with missing suns. To fill in curves of horses and ships, in honour of a bastard. Ubi Harold dux anglorum et sui milites equitant ad bosom. None of us can read, but the king of birds bows to Harold. We argue over who gets the name. H makes a strong man with sturdy legs sitting on a throne. Dame Bav cocks her head and clicks her tongue. Blue stinks and sticks in the throat, making a sob or laugh. Blue piss, blue spit but bruises come up green. And today we start for real. It is great praise to work in wool, she says, colour of the red breast and the dawn and the oak. It is forbidden for us to use ink, she says, but we may sew. Only three times a woman is laid out on the board. Ubiunus clericus, et elfgiva. Once for a devil who wriggles her hips, once for killing her sons on the field, and once for tearing her daughters, but only one named. He huffs and puffs, squatting in his stinking ditch, until three times a womb is pricked onto the cloth. So while they divide our portions, we split needles from bone and fashion an axe for a naked man and our chopping block. The, ta the tapestry itself is central to Tenta. Its tears, its stains, darns and its stitches are both a motif for memory and language and a template for the poetic forms within the, the book. But it left me feeling that words alone were incomplete. And so I was thrilled when Rose Ferriby joined the, the project as the illustrator. Her wonderful monoprints really work into the fabric and the textures of the tapestry and bring out a whole new richness of meaning in the book. And one of the things I particularly love about Rose's illustrations and why I think they're so important is they suggest a fragility and a vulnerability. Some of them even look something like skin. It's not, you're not sure whether you're looking at fabric, prints of fabric or even prints of human skin. And that really brings out some of that humanitarian concern which, which brought me to the, into the writing of Tenta. So that brings me on to my next extract, which is from the poem Wound, which is based on the experience of my grandfather, who was, as he put it, blown up in the Second World War and suffered as a result from what we would now call PTSD. So this is just a short extract from Wound. It blew him up an epiphany to meet a god in the air, not the sleepy old god, but a lord full of blast wind and organ rupture, and the wife's head slammed against the door for going to the pictures on a Saturday morning. Petrum patrum, Paradisi tempore. Taken into the air, 
he saw others, saints and prophets lifted by the hair, a boy snatched up by the crown to hear archer angels singing high above the field of Agincourt. Psychoneurosis, unknown words on a paper, invalided him out, his sentence a shock of unexpected clemency, army his whole life. Perry, Mary, Dixie, Domine. Cracked up, they said, but it's the heart. A feathery dove-like thing escaped its margins. And from up here, his bird's eye. A labyrinth of cratered lanes and blasted hedges. To digest his surfeit, death tosses back his true normand, tasting at first of apples the sweet rouge doré, the tart Rambeau, Perry, Mary, Dixie, Domine. But of course there is a political as well as a humanitarian dimension to the ethical crisis that Tenter addresses. So I'm next going to read an extract from our D-Day, which parallels the Second World War D-Day with the clearances of the refugee camps in northern France, which were also ironically dubbed D-Day. And this poem collages together extracts from tourist brochures, uh, visits to the beaches, newspaper accounts and interviews with World War II veterans as well as refugees. This is the D-Day for M. Puissiso, CEO of the Port of Calais, only 21 miles from Calais to Dover. On this beach, we sit down and weep. On the weekend before the clearance, there are violent clashes. Refugees throw stones at the police who retaliate with tear gas. We are so tired, but we play cricket on the sand and sing. On a clear day, we can see the coast, but we are afraid for winter and every day there is rain. We are soaking wet. So we get ourselves together in an orchard, we dream of the blossom and the cherry, we sit against a tree and dream of a bird with white feathers. On the first day of the exodus, hundreds of people form a queue in front of a warehouse for processing. They are shipped out in white buses. Unaccompanied miners are housed in freight containers. Then, there are no trees, no help comes. About 300 children are turned away and many are standing under a nearby bridge, not knowing what to do. There are no trees, just a wire fence. Chancellor Philip Hammond describes the situation in Calais. There is an ear of corn on our lips and our lips are so dry. There are large numbers of desperate migrants marauding around the area. Most come from conflict zones, Somalia, Eritrea, Iraq, Yemen, Sudan, Syria, Afghanistan. We sleep if we can, or even on the ground where we buried him. He was cutting our hair, how we were joyful and sang songs, but now, we dream of birds with no feathers. In our tents, we sit down and weep. How will we remember? This is our D-Day. And I'm going to finish by reading perhaps the most personal poem, uh, Intenter, which explores how personal grief relates to a more public commemoration and national tragedy. Before she died, I took my mum to visit the site of the Battle of Hastings, and this memory returned unexpectedly while I was researching for Tenter. And so that, this really led to the poem that I'm going to read at last to you, called Hush. A hill beneath, and a filled-in door, this bench, its damp wooden flowers, 
a dead tree stripped clean and time fucking stops. You reach a corner of you are there. You are there. An edge of grief you can park in an empty tongue. The fields are empty, that's near enough. You expect you have come here to honour the dead. An open field looks like battlefield words. Gone, absent, missing. You come to hold it in memory, but it becomes spongy underfoot. You do not mean to remember her, the time you brought her here. A list in a notebook of useful words. Blank, nil, null, hush, hush, shh, shush. Sodden ground, but your body remembers, so you try to follow even as it is hardening and solidifying, becomes a whole no longer possible to enter nor be held by it. Nil, null, hush, shh, shush. Hush. You cannot enter nor explore its spaces nor the dead in their apophatic silence. That gap in words. Listen, hush. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Susie. Thank you so much. I love hearing you read those poems. So, and, and especially that last one's always so moving. Um, thank you. Um, I, will, I will introduce Maria now um, to read from a wonderful new collection, Buried God's Metal Prophets. Maria Stagnica is a Romano-British writer and journalist based in Gloucestershire, whose previous poetry collections include Somnia and the Geometric Kingdom. Buried God's Metal Prophets is inspired by the experience of her brothers who live in a, who live in a Romanian children's home between 1978 to 1987. This was the period of Romania's Communist Party's disastrous Decree 770, which banned contraception and abortion at the same time as awarding women with more than five children an order of the heroine mother. As a result, an estimated 12 million illegal abortions took place between 1967 and 1989, and over 250,000 children were placed in orphanages or care homes. The setting of the book is based on her experience of working at the orphanage St. Stellion in North Romania. I will let Maria tell you more um, and I will mute myself. Thank you, Maria. Hello and uh, thank you. Thank you for this generous introduction, Sarah. Also, thank you, Susie, for sharing your work from Tenter. Such a beautiful book and inspiring poetry. I'm really, really inspired by this. And also, I'd like to thank you all so much for making, let's say, Zoom space for my book tonight. I mean, looking at um, my um, recording here in Stroud is minus three, but your presence makes me feel like plus 24, which is really extraordinary. Um, well, I suppose I wrote uh, Buried God metal prophets when I started to realize that the lived experience in communist Romania gave me um, an ever stronger feeling of being an orphan belonging nowhere uh, maybe out of defiance or rage or maybe needing to recover a place in time memories which have haunted me and maybe other people from my generation I mean historians and sociologists call this um, the decree generation or Ceausescu's children, uh, decrete, as we say it in Romanian. I mean, children with a key around their necks. Well, this is, of course, a metaphor recalling the Romanian communist reality in the 70s and 80s at the height of the Cold War, when children like me got on with their duty of growing up, while parents carried on with their duty of building an ever successful socialist economy. 
I mean, I suppose that growing up like that, quietly estranged, but together with others and with my siblings, uh, made me aware of an emerging sense of orphanhood. And, and I paraphrase um, Yulia Kristeva here, who said that uh, one becomes an orphan when one's parents don't matter, when one's own history doesn't matter. I mean, in this context, uh, the decree 770, which frames the context of this book, is one of those pieces of uh, history that contemporary politicians and society in general prefer not to talk about that much. It feels as if history did not matter. I mean, it does matter. And it's not just to me. I mean, how many times do we come across this deliberate forgetfulness? Um, this is not something new, it's something we tend to do when facing uncomfortable truths and difficult circumstances. I think about the length of time it took, for instance, Ireland to recognize the lived experience in the mother and baby homes. And it was um, recently in the news and um, the history and the, the stories of Irish orphanages throughout the 20th century. I mean, this kind of socio-historic tragedies can remain unacknowledged, anonymized, and lost in the social deluge. In the current climate, I'm really mindful that the children and the teenagers of our time are quietly witnessing the difficult reality brought in by the COVID-19. And as we carry on with the managing of the crisis, they are quietly growing up with these memories and it feels to me that we need to make space and time to listen to their experiences, to prevent history coming back to haunt us later, like my history is haunting me now. And now that I mentioned time, making a book is not a fast food line of production, really. This book is special and it's not a about a blurb um, on the back cover. Uh, I've been asked a few times in recent weeks, what is the book about? Well, I shall refrain from taking that responsibility. Not a quick summary. I think there's a lot to gain from direct engagement with the book rather than the summary. Well, I for one prefer <laughs> to check things for myself and rather than be told what to think. So I invite you to do the same. Whether the book is about, I don't know, a writing technique, a collection of stories or memories, whether it's about political, social engineering and the impact they had on a generation, whether it's about human cruelty or defiance, well, this book is about people. Now that I mentioned people, I would like to take a moment to thank and express my gratitude to you for giving your time for this with such generosity. And thank you, Luke Thompson and Sarah Cave, the best editors I could ever possibly dream to work with, the Palace Printers, which are the local uh, rent -a prize from Los Widio, which actually work to print the, the book and put it all together. Uh, and there are a few people, um, um, Angela Franz and Nigel McCoughlin from uh, University of Gloucestershire and um, Anne-Marie Cummings and um, Stella Mail from uh, UWE, that without their support, maybe this book wouldn't have been written in the way it was. Finally, to Antonia Glucksman, thank you so much for the book design and illustration. Antonia, Antonia, I think she's actually here, and I wanted to just invite her a few moments to share with us her work and how she engaged with, with maybe a very personal topic that is mine, but in a way such a, um, a part of history. I'm not sure if where, whether you are here. Um, maybe I, I, I did put you on the spot, Antonia. Would you be able to say Hi. a few words? <laughs> Um, yes, uh, I'll make it really quick. I don't want to take away any time from you reading these um, fantastic stories and poems. Um, uh, I felt so honored doing the illustrations for this book. When I first got the script, I read it from the beginning to the end in one sitting and wrote, look back, uh, can I do the illustrations for this? I, I, I need to do the illustrations for this. I want to give these um, these stories, these voices of these children that Maria has crafted, it felt like that, that it's their voices speaking to me. I wanted to give them a home in, in, a, in a book. And um, I, I can only hope that I have attempted this and, um, but I just wanted, I wanted to, yeah, to give them like a, a proper place to be where they belong. Um, I wanted the illustrations to be um, feeling quite real, um, almost like 
you are entering like a movie set um, or they're kind of things that these children could encounter somewhere. So this is an, they're all photo collages of different things, almost like imagined landscapes um, and little snippets of um, of kind of of, of documents of of um, things that could be part of the fabric of their life. Um, yeah, I, I just I I I wanted them all to have this feeling of um, complete authenticity um, to bring out the voices of the of these children and um, yeah I hope I hope that worked but yeah back to back to Maria <laughs> let's hear some Thank of you. those stories <laughs> Thank you Thank you Antonia really really privileged uh, to have worked with you. Now I will um, be going through um, a few poems uh, and texts from the book. The book is in uh, five parts and um, the first part is Bunkers, then second part St. Joseph Dogs, um, Pre-Confessions, Frostbites and Rust. Now the part, is, the first part talks about uh, how um, the decree 770 uh, led to the situation uh, on the abortions um, and how some people were born and, and abandoned and then it goes in second and third and fourth part talks about my experience of working with children um, with AIDS and HIV in an orphanage in Romania. The main characters are created around the, the voices of the children created around my siblings the voices of the adults created around the staff that worked uh, at the orphanage. And the last part is um, contemporary time. After December 1989, when the Romanian Revolution came, um, democracy took over. Bunkers. Radioactive milk. After curfew, she knocks on a door two streets down. 16 Lenin Avenue. A man who looks like a dentist takes her in. On the kitchen table, he checks how many weeks gone. She takes the poison, paying the bills. My arms, legs, shaped from her blood, kick, punch, grow in confinement. Her waters feed me. She asks a witch for spells, swallows the words with cups of tears until her milk turns sour. One night, the curse shoots out of her womb and starts walking. For some reason, the newly born survives. Six million, 549,823 reported procedures between 1967 and 1989. It is estimated that the number of illegal procedures could have been double father's dog. On the way home we walk through a building site with half-bricked houses. My shadow hops alongside his. Fireflies light up the top of a church. Look the clouds! Little girl playing mommy and daddy between metal cranes. She hums lullabies. Her dolls float in the sky. Let's take her with us. She's barefoot. Father hurries ahead. His boots drag the field's mud. His work tools in a satchel over my shoulder. Let's bloody leave it and go, he says. Let's climb up, give him some fudge. She might be hungry. Father hurries ahead. Come along, dog. It's dark. Child soldier. On the first day at school, I stop by a girl in high sign blue with a sharp tool, scratch her eyes, kick her silent in a pile of wood. In assembly, I turn up a barefoot, punch a dog in a fight for the best seat at the cinema, then escape through a window during the fire drill. A bird notices me drawing swastikas on the toilet door. It is nine o'clock. Headmistress invites father to a political chat. 
She reports the facts from a book with many missing chapters. Acceptance, she says, the best weapon against dreams. It rains and the world smells of people. Father's navy blue overall space up and down in the quiet corner of the school library. At night, I cough out a nuclear war. Father removes the poetry stuck in my throat. Part two, St. Joseph's Dogs. The afternoon sister Loretta says I have AIDS and sends me to the black back of the classroom. Everybody laughs because I correct her saying, you should pronounce it roulades. I show her the cake I've been keeping for days in my pocket in case mother turns up to take me back home. But she'd have none of this nonsense from me. Medical charts told her I've got a defect. Head too big, eyes too wide, hands grip wrinkled words, build foggy stories out of brother's muteness. A beast, not a girl, she repeats to the class, a beast. By the end of the lesson, I know what she means. Other children walk scared past me, point at the blisters I've got on my forehead. Out in the courtyard, I hear them shouting, she's boxy. And I feel rather proud. Someone gives me a name other than dog. Other rules if you've got AIDS. I figures out from what others say that I need to avoid playing by the swings in case I get cuts and bleeds over others. The same, I cannot use knives and forks through those spoons, yeah, if I cannot use fingers for soups and such legs. I'm beginning to practice pulling my own teeth, as they say, in case I need it. These days, sister makes you wait forever with, with toothache. And another thing, the stones thrown at me by children running around an oak tree, the end bothers me. If I keeps walking, I knows who I am. The next poem makes a reference to Gary Kasparov, who was the chess uh, world champion. A chess was introduced in uh, PE lessons in Romania during communism, and uh, we all played, and um, we all wanted to be Kasparov. Defectology. I read in an almanac that before baby Kasparov was born, doctors checked his mother for lead poisoning and decided there wasn't an immediate risk. Baby Kasparov had normal weight, five fingers on each hand, good legs like his father's, eyes neither too wide nor too small, head hmm, rather big. The nurse recorded six pounds 11, score 10. The authorities appreciate babies with high score. I hope that one day I get better at chess and takes Kasparov's place. As I think about this, sister comes in and says, there's a surprise for me. They're foreign visitors. They want, I think, I'm going to be adopted. But it ain't that. The foreign visitors want to see an AIDS child. Sunday before Easter, picking nettles for soup at the far end of the courtyard, I see you waiting behind the back gate and run to tell Father Michael. Blessed orphan soul, honor thy hairy mother says, giving you shoes and a sleeping corner beside me in the Soyuz dormitory. We call you bed 28, one of us with the same habit of hiding things under pillows, slices of bread and salami, coloring pencils, frayed handkerchiefs. Others think you smell of cured meat, but to me, you have the scent of grass layers and rivers back home. At night, so dark between our cots, 
I cannot see nor hold your hand when shadows rock back and forth against the bed railings. Sister Loretta knows everything. Drops two teaspoons of lorazepam in your milk bottle. The moon falls asleep above your head. The wall clock stillness drips on us with precision until early morning. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Funny how sitting alone in one place makes me believe I spend a day floating west on a Danube. After so long, we begin to feel our age. Seven years carried on shoulder blades, climbing stones, long conversation between old and young wounds. The words stuck to electric wires, stretch above houses and trees. All we hear is the wave of noise coming from power cables. Be happy, you are forgiven. Part three. Pre-confessions. Leftovers. Bed 28 does not know the difference between dreams and reality. Father calls her stupid because she likes leftovers. She'd swallow a chewing gum if you gave it to her and she's scared of cotton wool. It doesn't scare me, though I know it means injection. They'd say it's only a sharp scratch, they say, only a few days and before you know it, someone will turn up to get you home. At first, only a few nights. If you squeeze your eyes tightly and fall asleep, you'll wake in buttercup meadows with crickets flying high over the hills. The day she turned eight, I gave her a biscuit. I kept it for ages under the mattress. She kisses my hand breaks the cookie in small pieces, eats only half. Stupid says the smell of fresh bread makes the yard spin green stars and my eyes burst into crumbs. The yard kisses her back, green, tender, like the sun. Eyes close, we share the grains as cricket play their tune on repeat. Here say, our dorm is in the Sputnik wing for irrecoverables, which father visits more often. Though I'm stupid, I know there are lots of sins to confess here. That's why it takes him ages to get back to his office, red-faced, tired. So much to talk about that sometimes he has to work extra night shifts I wonder what Kasparov would think about this. Remember rules? Castling is the best defense strategy when everything else fails. Though coming to think of it, rules are already decided for us and comes with invisible chain reactions. It ain't bothers me. I pulled my first tooth out and it didn't hurt that much. The next poem um, describes the experience of a child in solitary confinement, and it also makes a reference to Rosalia Lombardo. Rosalia Lombardo was a child that was so much loved by her father. She died at two, two years old in 1920s, and her father, who was um, an embalmer, embalmed her, and, she, when she was, she, and then she was buried in a glass coffin. And when she was discovered um, recently, um, it was revealed that she is the best kept um, and preserved mummy of all times. 6th of December, day one. Father Michael left his cassock behind. I pulled threads off his edges, twisting black yarn around my finger until it knots itself tightly into a secret. Hours pass drawing moustaches on St. Joseph icon. I sketch Mary's eyes to look like mother's. Forest of amber with wide glades. The robe hangs around my shoulders with father's promise of hell on earth. 
I bit his hand at the altar when he tried to anoint me last night. His blood woozed pale on sleeves as he followed me back to the door. Night 14. I want to ask if hell is something or someone. You'd say it's the bus in flames I saw across the road during a history class. The fire brigade pulls out ashen bodies. Passers-by rush home, taking mementos. Hell strolls among them, comes closer, then asks father to cover my window with smooth metal sheets. Day 23. Give me a breath-holding lesson, give me hunger. Tear out Bible pages, bite my fingertips, swallow the air, make me stronger than granite, louder than church bells. God watches me stuck in the slow lane to piety. Orders, repent. I grin a hundred times. Jesus and Father Michael hold hands kneeling on flint. At mealtime, I chew glass shards. Night 37. Anybody there? The same as before. Nothing. I begin talking water tongue, end up searching for woods in shadows standing across my bed. They look like forests I knew back home. I'm drawing maps in case I lose my bearings and walk off course. Day 49. The past few days I learned to play the piano, tapping the door frame, repeating soprano leader in one key, the only tune mother's voice knows when soothing childhood pains. Night 55. Someone turns a key, the lock clicks and the brief sound of rain sneaks in through the opening. It feels like a sharp scratch. Day 63. I clench my fists on the table, hiding two buttons ripped from mother's dress last time I saw her. You'd say they look like half-cracked walnuts before father picks up a hammer to split them open. Day. Father, call me water or God's blood or holy. Call me by name or dog or just call by to see if I'm still here. Night. I, Gary Kasparov, take thee, Rosalia Lombardo, to be my lawful to hold from this day forward for better for richer to love till death us do part and finally a poem from the last part part five rust this poem is built from uh, you probably if you have the book you would have noticed that some of the words in quotes as well as in the poems are blacked uh, are cut off and I used the words to create the last poem which is this unrest if you keep still for too long in queue at the supermarket there comes a point when you look behind and see nobody else everybody kept moving closer to checkouts got their rations and left happy it happened to Kasparov in 2005 when Ponomoryov decided to go ahead, ignore secure protocols and break castling rules. He won the championship. Kasparov watched the empty chessboard at the Grand Arena until closing time when the manager asked him to go home. It happens to all heroes and all little beings, she said, locking up. On Mondays, I wear fundamental black for patient beginnings. I drink to my demolished house. My killer instinct plays the harp behind curtains. I am a dog reaching its hermit age. 
shaped bones chase after me in the playground with rusty swings. Father, we don't end up in paradise. We keep moving. I stop halfway a bridge to witness the birth of new cities. My fangs check rising buildings for bad omens. A dog must consider all possibilities on the chessboard before the game has even begun. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Maria. It's lovely to um, to hear you reading. I haven't heard you reading from Very God's Metal Prophets yet. That's the first time. It was lovely. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us for the launch of this um, wonderful, beautiful book. Um, I put links in the chat to where you can pick up the books if you haven't got them already. Um, and I also wanted to mention the artists again. I hope that's okay because we've got both uh, illustrators of Susie Campbell's Tenter um, and Maria's Buried God's Metal Prophets, both are in the room here uh, and they're both artists who we've worked with quite quite a bit now and I just want to thank them again for all their work on these. Um, so for Rose Ferriby who did the uh, artwork for Tenter, um, we worked with, in fact, one of our first illustrated titles was Melanie Challenges the Tender Map, uh, which won the Michael Marks Award for illustration. Um, and we've worked with Rose basically from the beginning. We've got another book forthcoming with um, Katrina Porteous and Phoebe Power in April with, again, Rose's illustrations, which we're really looking forward to. We've just got the first prints back from that. And also Antonia Glucksman. Um, we've just had a series of um, of books out with with Antonia. It's really basically Antonia's press these days. Uh, we had J.R. Carpenter's um, illustrated book with his lovely French folds, uh, Words for Worlds Upended, that was, and um, um, sorry, Antonia did the cover for Lucy Burnett's book, Lucy's in the Room, and I think asked a question earlier. Um, so it's really lovely to have this. This is a, a, a really amazing and beautiful book. And thank you to everyone involved in, in, in both of them, really, to Rose and Susie and to Antonia and Maria. It's been an absolutely uh, uh, wonderful process working with you all. And I hope we get to work with you all again in the future at some point. Um, we have a few minutes for questions and I've been making some notes of the questions. Um, I can see some more coming in now, so I might try and get back to those in a minute. Uh, we had a few coming in uh, that are general, and we had a few right at the beginning for Susie. So I'll get through, I'll, I'll start at the beginning. So Susie, just to brace you, we've got a few for you, and then I'll ask um, a general, I think it might be Lisa Burnett who asked the first one actually, which was, can Susie say a bit more about how she used the Bayeux Tapestry as a formal template for the poems? Yes, of course, uh, and and thank you very much for asking that question, Lucy. So um, I could I could say an awful lot about this, so I'm going to restrict myself just to, to just making a couple of of, of comments, uh, because the more I, I worked with the tapestry, the more it seemed to offer correspondences with the kind of poetic forms that I was experimenting with. But the two main things that perhaps strike me thinking about it now, first of all, the repairs. So. Um, a, a, Obviously, over time, the tapestry, the Bayer tapestry, um, has been uh, damaged. And through history, different people have had a, had a go at repairing it. Some of those repairs are very effective and some are really, really poor. And so one of the things that I wanted to do in my poetry was to get that idea of um, patching together different voices, different material from different centuries. Uh, and sometimes things that might seem quite in incompatible, such as using modern thread to re repair a tapestry, um, actually can end up having quite a powerful effect. So that was a real template for me, if you like, for some of the collage poems that you'll see in Tenta. And the other, um, I think, really significant thing for me in the tapestry is that in some places, the tapestry is actually worn right away and there are holes that have opened up in the fabric that are beyond repairing. And I wanted that to appear in the language of the poem. So um, if you look at the poems on the page, a number of them have used gaps and spaces in the text um, to get that sense of 
of, of words and language fraying away um, and reaching towards meanings and not actually engaging with meanings. Um, and so, as I said, I could actually go on for a long time about other aspects of the tapestry, but that's hopefully given you a little bit of an idea about how important it was as a template. Good answer. Um, we've also got, we had a general one from Beth, which I think would work for both Maria and Susie, which is about what your writing routine is. Should we start with Maria on that one? What was the question? Um, what, basically, what's your writing routine, which I think in lockdown has changed for us all a bit. It is, uh, um, I write every day. I write every day. Uh, and most of it is rubbish. So that is, you know, exercising them the hand. I write by hand, everything by hand. Um, and that's it, really. <laughs> there isn't a routine as such, but I think that the fact that, you know, uh, writing every day is, is just for me one of those things that helps. Do you want to come in on that one as well, Susie? Yes, I would love to. Um, so as it's probably obvious from Tenta, one of the things I tend to do with any poetry project is really immerse myself in the research. Um, and of course, that's a, such a wonderful stage. I'm sure many people on the call will identify with that. And then you get to that point where you're almost overwhelmed with the material that you've got. And so then it's really about how to find a, a way into then wrangling that material if you like into some kind of poetic form and often that material isn't just um, physical material it's often impressions experiences of going out into the environment and so I find what I often need to do at that stage is to have on one side a notebook for words on the other side a sketchbook and somehow between the scribbling down some words and drawing and scribbling and, and, and sort of doodling almost I start to be able to move out of the research and into a slightly different part of my brain. Um, and more recently, I've been finding if I then sort of make little homemade books, little DIY books, where I start to bring the words and the, 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 the drawings together, that somehow begins to move into the poetry itself. I've just, just got one here that I just happened to be playing with earlier. And that, that is just purely as a working method. And, and that, that ends up being disposed of eventually. Um, so that's just a, a, one of my ways into trying to move out of research into the creating of the poetry itself. Thank you. Um, one for, well, kind of for both of you, but maybe we'll give it to Maria on this one from Bryony, which is uh, thinking about the role of uh, literature, particularly poetry, in moments of uh, social or political crisis. Um, could Maria and Susie say a bit about poetic writing as a medium um, to explore, cr explore and research crisis? Um, I think Susie's going to want to come in on this one. Let's start with Maria. Oh, oh, okay. Um, I think that um, any, I don't know, any person that writes, thinks, or produces any piece of art uh, or any piece of writing um, has a duty in a way to respond, um, if they can, to a um, particular uh, reality that they experience. Um, and I find that you know, uh, talking about a crisis is something that you should be doing because this is, um, let's say, your duty or your job to do if, if you're a writer. But on another hand, though, um, on a more serious level, I think that um, we should never uh, shy away from discussing um, difficult subjects, um, um, uncomfortable truths. And I think that um, one of our... Um, aim would be to kind of unravel all of these and, and open conversations about uh, things that uh, get buried uh, or get overlooked as i said earlier in the the social deluge and uh, you know you know get get forget forgotten because sometimes we discover truths from which we can uh, learn and, and improve uh you know as a society as a human being susie Thank you. Yes, I always want to come in and answer all the questions, forgive me. Um, yes, I think um, that what Maria just said really resonates with me. But I think for me as well, um, one of the key things that poetry can do is reflect on, on itself and reflect on language um, and the way that language is so often implicated in a crisis. Um, and, and for me, that's sort of the political dimension, if you like, um, in, in the broadest term, is looking at how um, the, the way our, we conceptualise, the way that we 
other the way that we um, take sides. So much of that is connected with the way that we use language and, and, and to, to um, articulate the way that we um, engage with other people in the world. I also think poetry has a role in exploring where there's perhaps an image um, that has become culturally important in the way that people think about and deal with the crisis. One of the things that really struck me and the reason why I went back to the Battle of Hastings, um, and yet I was really wanting to write about the 21st century, was that idea of invasion. Uh, it seemed to me really significant that the tapestry shows that uh, William's army coming across the channel and that image of being invasion of invasion recurs over and over again throughout history, the Armada, Napoleon, right up into the Second World War. And that's the very language that's being used in newspapers now talking about the refugee crisis. So that, that image, if you like, that poetic image has got so ingrained in the culture, it's dictating the way that we react to a crisis right Right now. So that for me is a really important part of what poetry can do to explore crisis. Great, so I'm just trying to catch up on the questions. Um, I'm going to do two from the same person, I think, before it disappears. I'm going to do one for Maria from Karen Sandu. And um, before I do that, I should say that Karen's going to be reading with Harriet Tarlow in our next event on the 4th, I think it is, of March. Uh, Karen has asked Maria, such haunting narratives beautifully observed. I was really struck by the body in your work. I cough out a nuclear war and father removes the poetry stuck in my throat. There seems to be a real emphasis on the body displaced or the body usurped. Uh, then you mentioned mummies and this idea of preservation. I wonder if you could say something about poetry's ability to capture the bodily and or its ability to preserve and document. Love your work. Thank you. I think that that's particularly a po poetry strength to um, um, reveal and unravel um, these um, feelings as well as um, these, um, I would say, uh, I would say, yeah, okay, um, the way body feels, the way body looks, the, the way body moves. Um, and I think that in poetry, we have this chance of um, expressing that through uh, reflecting how um, words resonate uh, with our body. I think there is a big connection between the sound of the words and, and our body um, itself, you know, uh, the resonance will have an impact on our body as well. And I've try, I'm trying very hard to capture that um, as much as possible. But then there is also another element, uh, particularly uh, relevant in, the, in this book, that talks about um, trauma and how that might impact the body. Um, and this is what I try to capture because everything those children probably experienced um, had an impact on their body, on their, um, uh, what in, in their, on their development as well. And I've tried really hard to think. And I think that in this particular aspect, my um, siblings and conversations with them really helped. Um, discussion with them about how they felt and experienced um, those times. And there was a question about looking at whether um, this could be written in another language. I've, I've tried. And I think that um, uh, the language offers that kind of relevant distance between uh, an event um, and you as a writer. And I felt really safe to uh, write it in English and I would have never tried really to write it in Romanian. No. Yeah, we've got a few questions. That was another from Lucy Burnett, I think, who asked one of the first ones. Um, I'm going to ask another from Karen, which is to Susie. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit because I wrote it in, in my own version of shorthand, uh, saying, I particularly love your fragmentation of sound and I wonder how sound along with sight shapes your writing process. Thank you very much. Lo lovely question. Um, again, there's, there's so much to say there. I think, uh, again, I'll just restrict myself to, to making a couple of comments. And one of them, I think, really resonates with, again, with what Maria's just said about the importance of the body um, in poetry. And of course, memory is a really important theme that I explore in Tenta. And the body has such a, a role in memory and sound as part of the body has such a role in memory um, and the reinvention, the kind of the rediscovery of things 
things and the spontaneous rediscovery of, of memory through a sound, which we then almost reinvent as we as we replay it. Um, and that's so what that is one of the things that I explore in Tenta, even in the extracts that I read. I think there was a couple of times when I mentioned how it's almost the body that's remembering um, in, in a way that's different from the way that perhaps the intellect tries to remember something. And so some of the sounds and the echoes through Tenta, and again, I hope that you heard some things from the very first piece I read being echoed at the very end. That was to build a sense of a sonic memory through the work. And the second one was, again, that idea of trying to find connections between past conflicts like the Battle of Hastings or the First World War um, with, with now um, was through the the actual sonic echoes and the more I, I explored some of the texts I found that they weren't necessarily linked in terms of their content but they were linked in terms of their sound and some of the Latin that that I found um, rhymed with some of the quotations from refugees and finding those sonic e echoes helped to weave create a sonic weave as well as the visual weave which i hope is really apparent when you look at the book and look at the illustrations so i think there's another question that sticks on sound which is also for maria which is from uh, Jeremy Voden, uh, thanks Jeremy, um, which is, does Maria write to be read out loud uh, with the rhythm and inflections and pace? I don't actually, I don't write it to be read loud. Um, not as that, my, my um, main concern when I write is um, with the rhythm. The internal rhythm when you is if you're right in a way that um it, it influences how the body moves uh and how it feels um how you feel whilst you write it but i i i don't write it as such to be read aloud i would say the opposite but yeah i i try to convey it when i read it yeah it, and it's, it's very it sounds very different in a way but differently on paper than when it's read, read aloud yeah and I think we have just a couple of questions from Susan Hayward and from Aidan. Um, Susan's is for Maria. Can you tell us about the redacted text, the blackout text? A funny thing, really, that uh, censorship does to one. I mean, in uh, Romania, where I grew up um, during the Cold War, we experienced quite a strong period of um, censorship, and that was um, that reflected in literature, aspects of literature in the way we were educated. Um, and also the, the public discourse um, was censored as well. And it is very interesting how a child will then um, kind of um, um, assume, uh, I would say, would, I can't find the word at the minute, um, internalize, internalize the censorship. And I found uh, this big difficulty I have with, with letting go and, and be free uh, of censorship and every time even even now i'm talking about this and i'm thinking did i say something wrong um, uh, am i going to be punished because well when you grow um, up like this you are always aware of what you say and how you say it and i wanted to convey that through blacking out those words but then at the end of the book i, I created this poem uh, from the words that were blacked because I wanted to uh, give a sense of um, agency back to those people. Thank you. We had um, we had quite fun with the design. You wouldn't have seen that side of it. Um, <laughs> it was good. <laughs> it was quite hard. Antonia ended up pulling out these bits from redacted text that she's found and yeah. like, literally pulling out the blacked out. Um, which we then then superimposed on the the actual text. Um, yeah, I think it was really important. Oh, sorry. No, go I, just, on, I don't know if that's interesting, but um, uh, it was really important to me that these were actual reductions of a text that somebody made. That that th those were marks. You know, these words somebody wanted you not to read, um, and I found them in old East German Stasi documents. So they are. So I hope they. <laughs> have that little power of, um, yeah, I don't want you to read this. Yeah. <laughs> it worked, it worked really well and it was, it was, um, 
we, we had some, we had some fun putting them all together. <laughs> Um, the final question is, as far as I can tell, from Aidan. Let me just scroll up for it. Again, it's to Maria. Um, this book is much more direct and less surreal than your other work. How do you think your surreal practice has informed this book? Mm, oh, God. This is such an interesting question. Thank you so much. I, I had, I've reflected quite a lot on how my practice has changed over uh, in, in recent years. And I have to say, um, I think that particularly addressing this topic, um, I, I uh, went through a, a long process of preparation and I tried to um, uh, confront the topic um, head on rather than um, um, use um, surrealism or, or other ways of um, disguising. And it was such a hard process and it's, it's taken so long to write and get, you know, I find that um, tackling a subject uh, like trauma is uh, more potent when the conversation is direct uh, and visceral um, rather than uh, surreal. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that was our final question. So really just let's uh, say thank you once again to uh, Susie Campbell and Maria Stednika and to Antonia Glucksman and to Rose Ferriby, who's quietly somewhere in the background too, um, for all of your work on these two brilliant books produced about a year apart, I think. Thank you very, very much. Mm. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Cheers, mate. Thank you, Aidan.